It's The World This Week, seven days, four Paris-based correspondents, one hour. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Aaron Zaleski is their Paris correspondent. How are you? I'm well, thanks. I want to welcome as well Pierre Husky, president of Reporters Without Borders. Nice to Hello. see you. France24.com senior editor Lila Jacinto is with us, and so is Venezuelan reporter and photojournalist Sara Suarez. How are you? Good. The World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag World This Week. Lots to talk about. The fate of Europe, the latest on Donald Trump and Russia, Venezuela's meltdown. But first, it's the third week in July. We're in France. Let's begin with that time-honored rite of passage for a new French president, an appearance on the Tour de France. Emmanuel Macron's happened Wednesday for the 17th uh, stage of the Alps. Let's see, sorry, if you ever wanted to play sportscaster, what would you, what would you say when you look at, the, at these images of the, of the French president here? Well, he's young, sport is always something for the young people, especially passionate for that. But the thing is that the Tour de France has not a very good image the last years with all the doping. So, well, it's a, it's a funny place to be. All right, that's that's for the, the, the I guess when you the, the outsider's eye, but, uh, Macron, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's always this thing where you know there's a, there's a bit of celebrity showmanship. We remember in the past what Nicolas Sarkozy with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lance Armstrong, uh, Macron meeting by the way with three Tour de France legends: Raymond Poulidor, Bernard Thévenet, Stephen Roche. What do you think of this? This those images of a you know this 39 year old president? He's president of France and he's there. On yes, the but he's. Uh, uh, very image conscious and is yeah. building very carefully his image uh, as he has for the past two months. But there's something special about that day because the day before he hit his first crisis uh, with the resignation of the chief of staff, General de Villiers. And so uh, this appearance with uh, the handshake with the crowd and uh, and the happy pictures with the, the champions were uh, a good uh, counterweight to what had happened the, the day before, where, you know, the opinion is split about whether he did the right move or not. I, uh, he, I think he made a, uh, sure that he would uh, show his authority. You know, he was defied by the chief of staff who, who complained about the budgetary cuts, and he decided to make a, a very, very strong uh, remark about it. And he said, I'm your boss, and I don't accept that, that kind of attitude and the chief of staff resigned. Uh, some people say he confused authority with authoritarianism. Uh, it, 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 but, you know, you, these images show that uh, he still has a strong appeal with the, the public at large. Uh, with the army, it's a different story. With the army, it's a different story. French broadsheet of record Le Monde uh, called that crisis a crisis of historic proportions, the Army Chief of Staff, Pierre de Villiers, seen here alongside the boss during last week's Bastille Day Parade, rather his former boss, as, as uh, Pierre was just telling us, de Villiers resigning uh, after that row over the cuts in defense sp spending. Uh, what is the row? Is the row the fact that he spoke publicly and that, you know, the Army, there's a right of reserve where uh, generals aren't supposed to speak? Or is the controversy that, well, France is living above its means when it comes to having uh, soldiers on so many uh, fronts right now in Africa and the Middle East. Well, actually, you know, I mean, Macron, when he when he uh, took office, was you know really played up uh, France's military role. He visited Mali, and and in fact, these budget cuts are for this year. But in the long run, uh, the the French defense bu budget is, is is going to e increase. I think what is at stake here is is really the old guard in the military, and uh, you know, Macron being this young, having to assert himself. But uh, you know, if you look at the issue apart from you know the French media coverage of Macron style, which, you know, let's let's face this, a lot, lot of media, we tend to waste time on these, on these kind of things. But at the basic issue at heart, it is a civilian head, uh, head of state who makes decisions on budget cuts. So I think he was rubbing against the old guard, uh, de Villiers, de definitely coming from, you know, the, the conservative part of France, uh, rubbing against this, this young president who really, uh, you know, who's positioned himself from nowhere, neither the left nor the right. Uh, but Macron handled it, I, I think, uh, pretty smoothly because, you know, a replacement was, was announced very, very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, and then he, he, he rolled on to, to, the, to the next of his agenda. And, and if I may add, um, he's young and he's the first 
president who hasn't done his military service because the military service was cancelled uh, in, the 1990s. in the 1990s. So uh, 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 that may explain the overreaction uh, to, to it. And the second thing is that Macron was an aide to François Hollande. And what he learned with François Hollande is what not to do. And François Hollande was always criticized for lack of authority. And I think Macron wanted to show uh, so early in his mandate that he has authority, even in, in the most complicated context. And also, he seems to love the military, you know, whinging onto a submarine, you know, traveling in, in an armored personnel jeep. He, you know, he likes those. Uh, nice photograph again this week as Top Gun uh, on an airbase. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but, the, but the, we've seen the rows continue with the military, overspending and, and, and over leaks. And uh, Aaron Zaleski... Uh, French public opinion divided over over whether or not it was a misstep by Macron. Right, right. I mean, well, I, I think it's it's been divided for a few weeks now. There is back to what Pierre was saying about some people see it as he's asserting his authority, and then other people say, oh, it's a bit too authoritarian. Uh, that he sort of uh, has taken on sort of regal airs since he's uh, you know begun his mandate, and that's rubbing some people the wrong way. They feel like it's a bit too much his relationship with the press his sort of a distant attitude toward, towards uh, the public. Uh, I think been that his, uh, his government is very hermetic, and we have seen it uh, right. this, uh, in the beginning of his mandate, but his ghost is always going to be the fact that he's a very young man. Right. And he, he will have to deal with this for the rest of his period. So uh, this is Until one... Until he's old. Until right. he's old <laughs> enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but right now, that's going to be a, a mm. problem that he's going to have to face all the all, all the time. So I think he didn't appreciate a lot that the, the uh, Villiers talked the way he did. He would have maybe didn't react this way if he did it in private. And and I think that really is a message that he wants to send now. Don't do that to me again. All right. Uh, a power play in Poland is having ripple effects across the continent. Some say even that um, the future of the European Union is somehow at stake. The opposition in Warsaw protesting against a bill, the second one inside of a week, to tighten the leash on the judiciary, this time the Supreme Court. The president of the European Council's asked former prime, uh, pro, he's former prime minister, uh, Donald Tusk, has asked Poland's head of state to confer with him before signing uh, those laws uh, in the, and making them law of the land. Um, of course, those two men are from opposing political families, and judging by the angry scenes in Parliament this week, reconciliation doesn't seem to be on the agenda. The leader of the ruling Law and Justice Party, Yaroslav Kaczynski, at one point grabbing the podium mic Wednesday and blaming the opposition for the death of his twin brother, the country's former president, in a 2010 plane crash. Don't wipe your treacherous mouths with my late brother's name. You destroyed him. You murdered him. You are scoundrels. Now, this could seem like a domestic affair, Lila Jacinto, but uh, the point that was being made by the number two of the European Commission is that this wasn't the kind of, these weren't the kind of rules that uh, Poland had when they became EU members in, two th when the Poles became EU members in 2004, and that this undermines the rule of law throughout the continent. And also, there's been a steady drip of what is happening in Poland, you know, this being the latest development. But, the, you know, there have been crackdowns on the, on the media, crackdowns on NGOs. Uh, th this was really the, the last straw because this is, of course, the judiciary. And while, you know, so what we are actually seeing in Eastern Europe uh, is this, this, the rise of the illiberal de democracies. And, you know, and, and, and Poland is not as far in ad advance, for instance, as, as, as in Turkey. But if if you go back in Turkey, you see this always begins with the judiciary. That's that's a very critical uh, institution, which is when it starts getting under the control of one party or, or too much uh, control under the executives, then you see the steady uh, decline of a real democracy. And, and, and obviously, uh, Polish people, especially the youth, have realized it, which is why they are really taking to the streets. Which way is the EU headed now? Because you, you have uh, Macron coming in as president and uh, promising uh, more European integration. Once Britain leaves, 85% of the economy of Europe will be inside of the Eurozone. These countries, Poland, Hungary, 
They're not in the Eurozone. They don't have that common currency. Are, are we seeing a second divorce on the horizon? I'm not sure. I, I think there is this split at the moment uh, because, you know, clearly, uh, especially Poland and Hungary, uh, don't see at all the same way as, as Brussels and the core uh, EU members. Uh, and that's a big challenge for the EU because it's, it's a bit powerless to, to face those issues. And particularly, you know, there is the, the atomic bomb of the EU is uh, depriving a country of its voting rights if it's uh, violating the rules. Uh, the problem is that you need uh, unanimity of all the others. And Hungary has already said it would support uh, Poland. So uh, it's impossible to, to use the sanction uh, that are in the EU rules to face what Poland is doing. The, the optimistic thing about, if you want to remain optimistic about this situation, is that uh, in Poland, the society is very, very mobilized. Right. The civil society is very, very mobilized against uh, the, this government and these encroachments in the, the rule of law and, 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 and liberal democracy. And particularly, opinion polls show that two-thirds of the people under 25 are against the government at the moment. So you have this big gap between older conservative uh, polls and younger liberal urban uh, who are opposed to it. So, it, you know, there, there is a dynamic within Poland itself. So what you're saying is Poland's and, not Hungary? Uh, it's, same happens in Hungary. There is also... Uh, so what... What you know, the issue will be dealt domestically by those countries. Uh, I think uh, it's not so much uh, to us, the other EU members, to uh, force them into something they they, they wouldn't like. I think there they, there are um, confrontations, uh, political confrontations within those countries that will decide which way those countries go. If they confirm in the long run uh, these. Uh, illiberal tendencies, I think it will be a major problem for the EU and maybe there will be a second divorce. But at the moment, I think the, the, it's not over. And, and the civil societies in those countries are pretty powerful, strong and, and are uh, organizing uh, uh, defense. All right. Earlier in the week, uh, Poland's prime minister, along with uh, neighboring leaders from uh, Visegrad countries, that's Slovakia, the Czech Republic and Hungary, met with the Israeli prime minister who was visiting in Budapest. There, Benjamin Netanyahu's host rude the way the European Union ties aid and trade to human rights, or what Viktor Orban calls political motives. The European Union should appreciate the efforts made by Israel for the stability of the region. It is both in the Israeli and European interest because they are protecting us from new migrant invasions. New migrant invasions are the words that he uses, Sarai Suarez. Those are very strong words, effectively. And I wanted to go back to the... To the you were talking about the positive. I'm, I want to talk about the negative vision of, of what could be there. I think that there is a danger here with Poland is that... Um, Democracy is not a menu à la carte. It's not something you can choose what you want and leave what is not good for you. And if you're part of the EU family, you need to, to respect the rules. Uh, so that's what Poland is doing. They're choosing the things that are convenient and sculpting a democracy that just fit into their logic. And this is a danger because it's a message that can be received by other countries and, and is a, is a, is a complicated uh, message to send to the other EU. Also, the law and justice part, it's important to remember, it's, it's very nationalistic, it's very populist, and that's not really conducive to strengthening EU relations. Um, as Pierre was mentioning, there's a segment, there, there's sort of a generational divide. There's a segment of the population that backs this party and is equally nationalistic. And they see any kind of interference from whether it's a, a foreign body, whether it's a foreign government, anything that's not Poland is a threat to uh, nationalism. It's sort of populism at the expense of democracy. And then we have this younger contingent that's rising up and saying, no, you know, this is, you're, you're you know, infringing on our rights, you're infringing on our democracy. So it's, it's interesting to see how this is playing out in the, the two segments of society right now. Uh, the, the, there was a Polish journalist who wrote uh, in the Daily Beast a, uh, exactly. a piece uh, saying yeah. that Donald Trump yes. uh, egged <laughs> on uh, this move. That's being contested by some. But nonetheless, there was this speech, what was it, two weeks ago? Exactly. Just before the G20 summit, 
where uh, Donald Trump didn't talk about democracy, but talked about clash of civilizations and how I was wondering whether the West was uh, w was in danger of, of dying. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think in a sense, he, yeah, he definitely was sort of uh, giving a nod to this uh, nationalist populist sentiment. He also mentioned the Warsaw Uprising, which, it, of course, that's a sense of national pride. But that some of, I, I've spent some time in Poland and I've spoken to some people and they've basically told me that the country between the Nazi occupation and then the Soviet occupation that followed, the, the sense of being Polish was under threat time and time and again in the 20th century. So there's a sensitivity there, whether it's right or wrong, of any kind of foreign interference. And that might be fueling some of the, the dispute with the EU right now. The, the strange thing in, in, the, in the Polish case, more than the Hungarian case, is that Poland is a success story in Europe. It, it it's is. had the, 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 the biggest growth in, in the past Seventh decade. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, you yeah, know, And the nationalists uh, say they're pro-EU. Yes, I, I was in Warsaw two months ago. I mean, I hadn't been there for years, and, and it's, it's completely transformed. It's modernized. It uh, you just have to look at the cars, you know, the, 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 the standard of the cars are, are, has increased. I mean, there is well-being. I'm not talking of the whole country, probably, there is a gap between uh, the, the, the capital and, and the countryside. But still, uh, Poland is definitely a, a success story. It has benefited a lot from support from uh, the EU. And you have this weird nationalist uh, um, mayonnaise, which is uh, <laughs> uh, uh, t twisting the, the minds, especially with uh, uh, Mr. Kaczynski that we saw uh, on your video a few minutes ago. Uh, you know, you had these two Kaczynski brothers. One of them died in a plane crash on his way to Russia. And there is this paranoia and, and, and plot uh, conspiracy theories going around that uh, he was murdered. So all this makes a very weird uh, combination. Uh, just a final point on this, Leela, because you heard Sarai saying that uh, the EU should draw a line in the sand. Should the EU be stepping up or staying out of it, especially since the president of the European Council well, as Pierre says, as the that there's, the there's pretty, there's not, not that much the EU can do. I mean, you know, they can't press the nuclear ob uh, option, but uh, the nuclear button. But, I, you know, the one thing I, I noticed when, you know, we, we saw uh, Netanyahu uh, with the Visegrad countries and then, we, you know, we had Trump in uh, in Poland. These are both leaders who, who are very public about their their, their, their scorn for the EU. Uh, and, and, and Netanyahu is effectively outside the EU... But but, you know, drawing a wedge with the East European countries to be more pro-Israel. So, you know, there, there seems to be these leaders outside the EU, very anti-EU, and playing, you know, playing up these differences. And with Netanyahu, it, it, it's very striking because some of these far-right uh, nationalist parties are anti-Semitic, but he's willing to put that aside as long as, you know, because he sees Brussels as having an anti-Israeli uh, policy. So, you know, there are all strange bedfellows here, and they're all pursuing their own national interests. And speaking of strange bedfellows... We're going to talk about Donald Trump and Russia when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching The World This Week. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Aaron Zaleski, Paris correspondent, is with us. Uh, welcome back as well to Pierre Haski, president of Reporters Without Borders. France24.com senior, uh, senior editor, Alila Jacinto and Venezuelan reporter and photojournalist Sara Suarez. Now, uh, we were talking in part one about the disruptive effect of Donald Trump on Poland. Six months into his tenure, it sounds like the disruption is not just in Poland. The United States, while still reliving the presidential campaign, with every day a steady drip of allegations and revelations about his ties with Russia. The list in, this week includes the probe into Trump's business ties, Revelations. He had a second sidelines meeting with Vladimir Putin at the recent G20 summit in Hamburg. And now uh, there's like this change of spin doctors. The communications director for Trump's outside legal team resigning and Sean Spicer quitting as White House spokesperson reportedly over the naming of Wall Street financier Anthony Scaramucci as new White House communications uh, director. Plenty of turmoil, and it's only been six months, Aaron Zaleski. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> it's like a revolving door, and then we have the ever-present cloud of uh, Vladimir Putin sort of hovering over the White House this whole time. Is that your view, that sort of you thinking about Putin every time you see a decision made inside the White House? I don't know about thinking about Putin every time, but it, it's something that he hasn't been really able to shake, and it seems as though every week there is some new revelation um, what's really going to be interesting to me is seeing what ends up happening with the you know, Robert Mueller investigation. Will uh, Trump and his supporters try to undermine that in any way? Uh, secondly, the, the thing with Scaramucci, another interesting point, we have another uh, political, we have an outsider. He's had. He's never held a formal. He's a uh, Wall Street financier. Exactly. He's not, he's he's, not he's somebody who's worked some in media. Books. He's never um, held any formal uh, political communications role. So, uh, I mean, it's. It can't be easy uh, handling communications for this administration, so I'm, I'm interested to see how this is going to, to pan out in the coming weeks. And, and even if you do handle communications, what do you do with the president who's right. just going to speak his mind on Twitter? You know, my problem is why are we spending so much time on this? You know, when we get to Mueller's investigation, when there is actually a conflict of interest, you know, the amount of international attention. I'm just back from Washington where they are clearly unaware of what is going on in the rest of the world. They never really were. All right, all right. And now Leo, these details Leo. of which spokesman goes in and out, you know, if Mueller gets fired, if there is a conflict of interest, that's the story. You know, the, the rest of the story, you know, this revolving door is just internal Washington politics. Uh, well, no, I, I disagree. I mean, it is, it's unprecedented how many people have been coming and going, and it's only been six months in. That doesn't typically happen in an administration in Washington. I mean, that's fine yeah. for Americans, but, but why are we <laughs> spending so much time on this? Do, pe do people know the revolving door of what's happening at be the Elysee? No. Well, because it, it is affecting us. Uh, first of all, you have a dysfunctional administration. So uh, uh, someone, I think the, the CNN was pointing yest out yesterday that not a single major piece of legislation has been passed for the past six months, uh, which is unprecedented for a new administration. I mean, you always say that the first 100 days are crucial. Not a single piece of legislation. And secondly, there are uh, foreign policy decisions that are made that are not always uh, very coherent uh, or well explained, like uh, yesterday uh, suppressing the support to the uh, uh, moderate uh, forces rebels. in uh, rebels in in Syria, uh, which uh, was interpreted as a uh, you know a gift to to Russia in, uh, in a effect. bone thrown to right. I mean, yes. don't get me and, wrong. And and so that that has an impact on the rest of the world. Uh, the way. Uh, uh, Donald Trump is behaving with Iran is, mm -hmm. is obviously of major geopolitical consequences in the world. The, way the mess is created in the Gulf uh, when he made this tour in Saudi Arabia and his speech, and, and immediately afterwards there was this quarrel with Qatar. Uh, the, the way he's handling, or for the moment, uh, fails to handle really the North Korean uh, threat. I mean, all these issues. Uh, are in the hands of a, a dysfunctional president. Uh, and you don't know who, uh, who he listens to, uh, what the motivations are. Uh, he doesn't have the right people around him. I mean, there's still no ambassador in Paris uh, for the, from the US. Um, no one right. cares. You know. Right, I mean, this is a superpower. And there are so many issues at stake. Are we really covering it that, it that way? No, we're just covering it as, as a little mm. parlor game. That's the problem. Mm. All right, let, me, let me ask Sarah Suarez, because yeah. uh, Kiaski was mentioning dropping the support for the anti-Assad rebels. We have this week uh, Russia-backed separatists in Ukraine declaring a breakaway state, probably with the consent of, uh, 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 of Moscow. Do you, does your reading of Trump's relationship with the Russians sort of color your view when you, when you read these news stories that... I think that the problem is that we don't get him yet. Six months after the media or the people, nobody gets a, an idea of what he wants to do. So he's always surprising everybody. And, and this defile of people working around him, leaving and coming back. And I think the, the ones that are really enjoying this administration are the Russians. I mean, uh, Sergei uh, Lavrov said that maybe there was a fourth meeting in a toilet. I mean, they're even joking about <laughs> what's going on with, with Putin and, 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 and Donald Trump. So I think Russians are having a lot of, Moscow is having fun with this, and we are all really unstabilized, uh, destabilized uh, around the world, because this is a major country that matters in every other administration, and, and it's the first time we're facing a situation like this one. 
All right. You have no power to darken Turkey, President Erdogan's response to a travel advisory put out Thursday by Germany to its citizens. This as the mass crackdown that's followed last year's failed coup attempt continues unabated. This week, it included proceedings against a detained German human rights activist. The most absurd things are possible. You've been traveling to Turkey for years where you have acquaintances and friends whom you've been visiting for years, Turkish citizens who are then possibly being suspected by Turkish secret services of being close to the Gulen movement. All of a sudden, you're a terror supporter. In other words, completely innocent German citizens can become associated. Germany must pull itself together. They should know that they can never scare us with these threats. They should know that if their judiciary is independent, well, then ours is even more independent than theirs. Ours is even more independent than theirs. Pierre Askia. It's a joke. It, it, frankly, it's a joke. I mean, anyone who has followed uh, the court cases for the past year since the failed coup, coup in, in, uh, in Turkey knows that the judiciary is uh, completely, 100 percent, in the hands of the political power and that what is happening at the moment in Turkey is far beyond uh, the consequences of the, of the coup. It's just trying to uh, put a, a hold on everything that is opposed uh, to President Erdogan's power. And, and Reporters Without Borders is going to be Monday at the trial of the Jumhuriyet journalists. Yes, the media are uh, the, the, the first line of that battle. 166 journalists are currently uh, in prison in, in Turkey. It's the largest jail for journalists in the world. And Monday you have the, uh, the, the showcase uh, of uh, 12 members of the staff of Jumuriyet, which is a, a major daily newspaper that has been uh, revealing very serious uh, stories uh, even before uh, the attempted coup. Uh, their editor is currently exiled in Germany, and those remaining editors are facing a court on Monday. So there will be a representative of Reporters Without Borders, because I think this case is uh, a really a, a good example of what is going on, which has nothing to do with the failed coup and the Gulen movement. Leo Jacinto, were you surprised uh, by uh, Zygmar Gabriel's uh, statement there? I have to uh, admit I was surprised because it just seemed like Ger Germany was rolling over. This was also this has also been a thing of, uh, you know, a, st a steady drumbeat uh, of uh, tense relations between Germany and Turkey, and it just seemed like Merkel would be qu keeping quiet, um, mostly because of the EU-Turkey uh, migrant deal. But it's also Germany's uh, pre-election season, so uh, but you know, but both parties seem to agree. I think the last straw was the fact that Turkey is using German citizens, and the German uh, tabloid Bild reported this, uh, as sort of as, as a leverage to get some of, the, uh, some of the people that Turkey wants from Germany. So, you know, Turkey has accused uh, a lot of uh, German citizens of having Gulenist links, and they want some sort of a prisoner exchange. That's what uh, a German tabloid says. But, you know, but the fact that, you know, the last uh, arrest of human rights activists, including the uh, the Turkey director of Amnesty International was was the last straw, and of course there's a there's a German journalist as well. So uh, I think that Erdogan plays you know very tough. He plays a very tough domestic act, but he does not always. He's not very good at at the international front, on the foreign affairs front. So I think he's overstepped it on this time. Uh, this time because Germany is a major economic power for Turkey. Tara Suarez, he's overstepped it. I think, as you say, I completely agree. He's, he, maybe he's used to do to treat the people inside his country this way, but Germany is not the same thing. And and I, I believe this the theory that that you read about a possible exchange uh, makes a lot of sense for for people like Erdogan. Uh, human rights uh, defenders are terrorists, so we know the logic of this kind of, of governments and and this uh, kidnapping. I, so I'm going to give you this, and you're going to give me my people back. That will make sense uh, in the negotiation. It's really remarkable. Is that just a few years ago there was there was talk about Turkey possibly joining the EU and and the change. Yeah, it was a the, model yeah, to the Arab world um, as well. It's astonishing dumb, the change. Yeah. yeah. Now, Lila Jacinto. Um, you mentioned Fethullah Gulen earlier, who's blamed by Erdogan for that failed coup attempt a year ago. You and Philip Crowther uh, interviewed him at his home in Pennsylvania and asked him 
whether the uh, friend turned foe of the president was indeed a cult leader. I don't like myself. I don't like people who like me. I see myself as the smallest person amongst people. If I can be rescued, I can only be rescued by the mercy of God. I consider myself a terrible person. I consider myself a terrible person. A bit like Socrates saying, I, I'm the smartest man in Athens because I know I know nothing. Uh, what, what was he? It's, it's a little bit cryptic. What was he like? Well, I mean, to be fair, if you ask someone if you're a cult leader, you know, this is the... But, you know, we asked him a lot of very, very direct questions, very pointed questions. You know, this is Turkey's most wanted man. He's an aging cleric. Uh, he's ailing. Uh, I found him uh, pro. Uh, and surprisingly direct. He answered every single question, which was a, which were tough questions, including, you know, a very, uh, you know, the Turkish government case of this uh, this individual who belongs to his movement. Uh, his name is Adil Oksus. I asked him, do you know Adil Oksus? You know, answer all the Turkish government's claims about this man because the, the government's claim really hinges on this man. He answered it to the point. He did not evade it, uh, and it was a very long interview. It was it was one hour, which we cut down uh, to, to fifteen minutes. Uh, so uh, he, I got a lot of answers from him, and what I definitely got from him is that he's he's very clued into what is happening in Turkey. He's very well read. He's eight thousand kilometers away from home, but he knows what's happening. He knows what's happening, and the uh, accusation that we hear a lot is if. Gulenists are not solely responsible for that coup attempt. They might be partly responsible. Was that the sense that you that you have coming away from this uh, from this interview? Well, I've been reporting on this this coup investigation for a year now. Uh, Gulen's uh, himself, his his responses has, has been consistent. Uh, you know, there could have been some of my followers. He has this vast movement, and the whole problem with this movement is that it's it's you know it does not have a, a very strict organizational structure. You know, th this guy, you know, he has this 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 uh, this this message of education uh, progress, and you know, his followers have schools all over the place so it's you know it's very hard to say that that you know the order came from pennsylvania there could have been gulenists in the mix and there could have been ultra nationalists and kemalists in the in the mix as well but one of the things that's emerging especially with this critical figure uh adil Oksus, is that there seems to be some sort of plot with uh, turkish uh, intelligence uh, services so gulen's argument has been consistent from day one. You know, he's not denying that maybe some of his followers would may have been part of the plot, but he didn't give the order. Mm. We're going to turn our attention to another continent and a grim milestone in Venezuela. The death toll from uh, more than three months of protests has now officially topped 100, including two on Thursday during the nation's largest general strike since 2002. Venezuelans protesting the meltdown of the economy and plans for a July 30th vote to give the president the power to rewrite the Constitution. Of course, not everyone agrees that Caracas was brought to a standstill by that general strike. And today, July 20th, we have triumphed again. Work has triumphed. Love, life, and hope. The chamba has triumphed. They, the opposition, who have never worked, let them carry on not working. We are moving forward, comrades. Uh, what, what does that mean, the chamba? Chamba means the work. It's a popular word to, to talk about the work. In fact, going to work. This is great because it will mean that there is seven million and a half of Venezuelans who are completely rich and they live, I don't know, in a yacht and just doing nothing. Th those who voted in that plebiscite Those last Sunday. who voted on the 16th of July. Um, it was a success in, in the whole country. Uh, the, the, even the little cities were, were stopped and, uh, and it really worked very well. I saw a few videos of the president Maduro um, hanging around with his wife in Caracas trying to show that everything was normal. Um, but he only did that in a, in a short perimeter of um, in this downtown, really core downtown, which is mainly Chavista. And the opposition even can go there to, to, to do a demonstration. 
So it's it's the place where all the the people who work for the government uh, are, and that's why there was people in these images. Uh, but the situation is really critical, and this is the last week before the election of the Constituent Assembly. is going to be uh, the beginning of a new conflict, I think, because the National Assembly is going to be done, and they're going to win. There is no way they're going to lose that. And uh, the opposition couldn't manage to stop this election of, uh, of the 30th of July. Seven millions and a half uh, that we obtained in the place beside was not enough to stop the, the, next, the next election. The, the, this July 30th July vote 30th. that's going to come up. Now, we had this week the United States talking about stepped-up sanctions. Is that a blessing or a curse for the opposition, a country where the U.S. Is, doesn't always have very high street cred? That this is not really... Um, it, it made uh, a big... A big uh, problem in the country and actually the government is afraid of these decisions like what's going what does it mean concretely they re, the united states remained the main partner in 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 oil to venezuela so if they really apply that they stop buying our oil the consequences for the people are going to be just really the worst worse than when it, what we have now so um but Still, we don't know exactly what they're talking about. They were very vague about it. They made accusations of narco-traffic. They called uh, Diosdado Cabello the Pablo Escobar of Venezuela, which is a comparison, a very strong comparison. And uh, we still have to see what's going, on, what's going to happen with the 30. But I think the conflict is going gonna, is gonna to be still harder after the 30th of July. The president say, when we win, the peace will come back. And he's already talking about putting in jail a lot of the representatives of the opposition. Uh, Piaski, earlier we were asking about whether or not it's internal meddling in internal affairs, and we were talking about Poland. Uh, what does the international community do here? Well, th there's been a lot of talk of, uh, uh, you know, helping mediation discussions and so on. The Vatican at one stage was uh, involved, uh, the uh, Organization of American States, the uh, uh, Colombia, the neighbor, and so but uh, for the moment, no, no one has really uh, managed to get into uh, something concrete and, and, and serious. And, and I think uh, it's really needed because, uh, you know, the situation you described is, is a deadlock that can only go uh, into further violence. I mean, 100 people killed in a country like Venezuela is no small matter. I mean, it just shows that there is the potential for far worse and, and I think it's it's the duty of everybody else in the world to try to help. Even the French ambassador was on TV. In, in, in uh, the, there's a new ambassador who just arrived, and he, uh, he and he said uh, yeah, France was ready to help if if any you know if there was any possibility. And I think uh, uh, th that's really so. Beyond the, offering help, there's not much more that the outside world can do. Well, the the the, the regional uh, organization obviously. Uh, should have a, a say uh, in in trying to come to the rescue of uh, civil peace in in uh, in Venezuela, and you have a regional organization, but it's powerless. I mean, it's it hasn't got teeth uh, to to step in domestic issues like that. So it it should be uh, the role of those who have any influence on uh, on the government and uh, uh, to to try to convince them to enter some kind of negotiation. Otherwise, the descent into hell is, is going to continue. Piaski, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well uh, Sara Suarez, Aaron Zaleski, Lila Jacinta. But please stay with us because Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Hi there. Emma, did you hear Leela earlier saying how we focus too much on what goes on inside of the White House? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very sorry because I'm about to do it again. Um, <laughs> there's been a big departure. Not that much of a surprise. I think everyone felt it was coming. Uh, some of us thought it was coming for a lot longer than uh, it actually ended up being. But uh, Anne Telnes of the Washington Post tweeted this. It's about time Sean Spicer, because the beleaguered press secretary has finally resigned. Uh, lots of reactions online, including from Ariana Huffington, who uh, tweeted this. 
the Thrive Award for the person who has improved their happiness the most in one day goes <laughs> to Sean Spicer. Uh, Comedy Central too tweeting about this one saying that he lasted six months longer than anyone had predicted. <laughs> and I think perhaps it'll be the comedians, the US comedians, the talk show hosts who are going to miss him the most. Uh, the Daily Show were very, very quick to tweet out um, a sort of vi video eulogy of sorts. Uh, take a look at this. Guys, good morning, good afternoon. Good evening, good afternoon. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. You're shaking your head, I appreciate it, but, but, um, with respect to, um, uh, over the, hold on one second. You don't get to just yell out questions. We're gonna raise our hand like big boys and girls. Demo, demo. Denmark, as a designate education point, book, book points. The Sa al Shar, the Sa al Shar. A shot. Oh, Sean! Sean! What about the Putin call? Sean! Where did Sean go? So there you go, the Daily Show's <laughs> ode to uh, Sean Spicer's press briefings, which we haven't seen that much of recently, right. most of them have been off camera. Now the reason for his resignation, the New York Times were the first uh, to get the scoop on this one, uh, was because of the appointment of Anthony Scaramucci as the new White House Communications Director. Um, he apparently, Spicer, was vehemently opposed to that appointment. Trump wanted him to stay on, but he said he couldn't uh, in those circumstances. Mm. Um, now, Anthony Scaramucci, or Mooch to his friends... Mooch. Uh, Mooch, yes, okay. is a Wall Street financier, um, a major Republican donor, uh, who has actually sold his stake in a major global investment firm in order to facilitate his move into uh, politics. It does make you wonder, though, about how much that's draining the swamp when you're employing people like him. Uh, the best headline... Who, 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 as Aaron Zaleski was mentioning, <laughs> don't have experience handling media. Absolutely. Uh, well, he, he has had perhaps more than some. Uh, my favourite headline on, on this comes from the Daily Beast. Spicy bales, White House flails as mooch prevails. Very nice. Um, but what is interesting is, um, as I said, he does have experience. He's been a Fox News commentator for a pretty long time now. Um, and uh, apparently Trump was impressed by his uh, defence of the Trump administration. However, he obviously didn't dig too far back in the archives because this clip has been unearthed from Fox Fox News uh, by an NBC producer, Brad Jaffe. Uh, and in this, he describes Trump, who was then a presidential candidate, as a hack politician, anti-American, very divisive. He said he's going to be president of Queens County Bullies Association. And he went on to say that other, other politicians were just too scared to take him on because he's got a big mouth and they felt it would be more damaging to them if they were to try to actually take him on themselves. So what he said in response, uh, doing their job for them, is you're an inherited money dude from Queen's County, bring it Donald. Now, he went on to say that he thought that the presidential campaign of Trump would implode, so he never imagined mm. a Trump presidency. But it is interesting to see those words because that surely doesn't bode terribly well for their relationship going forward. Um, it would appear that Sean Spicer himself didn't actually know what was going to be happening because this was tweeted out at 5.36 at US time, or is it... You, uh, French time, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, 5.36, that was tweeted out. Business as usual, check out the uh, president's weekly address. Less than 20 minutes later, we got this tweet from Paris Ken Thrush. Yeah. Yes, less mm. than 20 minutes later. Um, so Scaramucci there uh, being reported that he is the new White House communications director. Also interesting to note that uh, lots of people apparently weren't in the loop on this, including Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon. Uh, Reince Priebus, the chief of staff for Trump, was also the man responsible for bringing in Sean Spicer. So it does make you wonder if there are going to be bigger... Um, you know, more heads could roll, mm. whether there'll be more re repercussions from this. Some people really not um, getting on the bandwagon of, of eulogising this, uh, this person who's developed cult status, but perhaps for all the wrong reasons. Um, Eric Garland says, Spicer propagandised a plan to destroy democracy, hide treasonous collusion with a foreign power. He's not a kitschy joke, but a villain. Very harsh, but lots of people really pointing out that he has brought us all a lot of amusement, whether he meant to or not. These are the faces of reporters as they try to make sense of one of his briefings. Uh, and uh, <laughs> final word on this one. Um, farewell, ah. Sean Spicer. You were terrible at your job, but I'm really going to miss those Saturday Night Live <laughs> skits about you. <laughs> Because, of course, the wonderful Melissa McCarthy portrayed him in a way that uh, everyone will miss. Now, well, and we, and we can relive, I suppose. Many thanks for that, Emma <laughs> James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here for The World this week.